Well, Father, we are really grateful for the way that you've designed your kingdom. And we thank you, Lord, that as we gather here this morning, as uh, we gather together, even some of us from our homes, uh, we thank you for the privilege of being part of this unseen but very with us now kingdom. We're grateful, Father. We honor you and we praise you. And we ask God that as we continue on into the word this morning, that just as you have throughout the morning, you would continue to manifest the reality of that kingdom in our midst. We ask, Lord, that you would use the word to transform our hearts, to challenge our hearts in thinking. Uh, we ask God that you'd use the word to encourage us. We ask God that you would use the word, Lord, to continue to transform us. Uh, we declare today that, Jesus, you are really our only hope. Amen. And we thank you, Father, that Jesus is up to the task. Amen. 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 It is good to be with you today, whether you're here in person, which is absolutely wonderful, by the way. I love, <laughs> I love having folk in the room, although I appreciate the, the fact that, that he met us before, right? Uh, when, when most of you were, all except for six of you were at home, <laughs> he still met us. It was wonderful. We're grateful. Um, uh, let me just say this before I move into the teaching today. If you are looking for a pastoral word with regard to the uh, current um, turmoil that the earth and especially the nation finds itself in, uh, a week ago, no, actually this past Wednesday I sent out a um, uh, post and last week I preached a sermon. Uh, and at this point I have no update from heaven. <laughs> and if I've learned anything over the past 25 years, your opinion will not, my opinion will not help you today. Uh, so my goal is to be at least as much as I can like Jesus who only said what he heard the Father say. And I'm sure he's speaking many things to many people of a higher rank than I am. And I don't say that with false modesty. I do believe that's true. Uh, but I'm a local pastor. I've heard what I've heard. I've said what I've heard. And, um, and I'm here today to equip the body for the work of ministry. Amen? So I hope you'll open your hearts to that, to that task. Uh, I will say this, there's never been a time that the earth needs the body of Christ to be being the body of Christ. Amen. Never, never, never that I can think of. Uh, maybe in those earliest days of the church when it burst onto the scene, perhaps then I suppose, but, uh, but boy, I'll tell you, I'm, I love history and, and I've read history and boy, the, the body of Christ needs to be the body of Christ today. And so, and part of that Part of being the body of Christ today is to come into a deeper understanding, not, not with our mind only, certainly with our minds, but even more importantly, as Alan alluded to, with our hearts with regard to the blood covenant of Christ. Um, that is the one thing that really does separate us from other humans. I mean, because of the blood covenant, when we accepted Christ and when, he, when the King of glory entered into my heart, when he entered into your heart, it is such a wonderful thing to know from Scripture that in that moment, I became and you became an entirely different type of creation. Amen. And I think it's, it's, we need to remember that. We, that gives you great mercy for, for other people uh, when you realize that we have the advantage of being a new creation. We have the advantage of living under an open heaven. We have the advantage of not only living under an open heaven, but we have the advantage of having God himself live within us. And we'll touch on that a little bit as we move in, into today. But, but Lord, help us be equipped today. Amen? Amen. So, and I've started uh, the last several of, these, uh, of the sermons of this series with this same passage out of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, the second part of verse 25. Jesus on that night in the upper room with his disciples before his crucifixion, uh, he, he called their attention uh, after dinner uh, to the cup, to the wine. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so now for 2,000 years, the body of Christ across the earth has been remembering that through Jesus, God uh, gave a new covenant. He gave the ability for us to enter into a new covenant with the living God. Uh, and, I, and as I've said uh, probably four times now, this being the fourth, uh, Jesus paraphrasing was saying this, this cup represents the new covenant to be guaranteed through my blood. And that's a big deal. When God guarantees something, period, it's a big deal. When he guarantees something through the blood of, of his only begotten son, there is no higher stamp of his commitment that he could have made. And I've made that point, I know, over and over again, but I think maybe uh, it might be the single most important thing for us to grasp from this whole idea of the new covenant is this, God has so committed himself. And the reason that's important is um, uh, I've flailed about over the past 40 years. I've done well sometimes and I've done poorly sometimes, but his commitment to me never wavered, ever. And whenever I came out of those times of wavering, those times of uh, disappointing myself and others around me, and certainly I'm sure disappointing him, he was always there to meet me and to strengthen me and to encourage me and to urge me on. Now get up. We got, we got somewhere to go. We got places to be, things to do. Uh, that's an important thing, I think, for us to remember is he has made a commitment. It's, it, and he could not have picked a, a way that he would say that more loudly, I don't believe. Now, moving on, that uh, new covenant, we've been looking at Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. This is actually first found in Jeremiah. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to with the four colors there is that new covenant uh, we, need to, we need to understand that it, it's a simple grid to me that there are four things the Lord has committed himself to. Now, it takes an entire book, <laughs> Old and New Testament, to build on this foundation. But what I find by understanding that he has made four specific commitments to me, it really helps me how I approach this book. If that makes sense. And the first commitment, of course, is I will put my laws into their minds. Let me pause there and remind us from a few teachings back what he's saying there because that word law will trip you up if you're not careful. What he's saying is I will put my precepts, which is the way I've designed the earth and my kingdom. My commands, which are the things that I've said, if you will do life this way, life will go well with you. And my promises, I have purchased this and offer it to you. That's the law. Uh, he promised that he would put his law into our minds, and then he would write them upon our hearts. The reason that's so critical, it's at that point that faith is birthed. Amen. The fact that I know something doesn't birth faith. But when God writes it on my heart, then faith comes alive and I can obey what needs to be obeyed. I can take hold of the promise that needs to be taken hold of. And I can also walk in the precepts of the kingdom with power and authority. Amen. See, that's why that's so important. But God's committed himself to that. Right. I mean, at the risk of uh, getting hung here for just a minute... <laughs> Let's consider how important that is. Under the old covenant, you, you had to work that out in your human ability. Under the new covenant, we've been given supernatural grace, a commitment from God that He is the one who's going to give it to our minds and write it on our hearts. Our part is to cooperate. Simply engage with him, lean into him, to use modern terminology. And then I will be their God, and we're going to look at that today, and they shall be my people. We'll look at that next week. Uh, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. That may be, I tell you, if you, we'll get into that in, in about two or three weeks. If you read the Psalms, and if you read the 50% the of the Psalms or so that David 
<laughs> wrote, that was the longing of his heart. And he touched the Lord in as deep a way as someone could touch the Lord uh, in the Old Covenant, through the Old Covenant. But here we are walking out the fulfillment of that man's cry. We are experiencing what it is to know God. Uh, and then, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So say four. four. Say it again. Four. four. One more time to wake you up. Four. four. Okay, now let's move into this today. And I will be their God. We started on this two weeks ago. It was interrupted by uh, last week's sermon, and now we're picking it back up again today. Now, let's talk about what that means. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, we used Hezekiah, Asa, and David uh, as, as examples. And from their lives, we sort of extrapolated that what this means under the Old Covenant, if you would have asked any one of those three, if you would have asked any prophet under the Old Covenant, if you would have asked any what we would call today Bible-believing Israelite, uh, they would have told you these four things. Protection. Provision, presence, and guidance. That was, the, that was the great need of humanity. And the truth is the reason, if you think about it, the reason that the, the, those who are outside of the covenants of God, even to this day, uh, that's what the idols were about. The idols were about trying to cobble together some collection of deities that could provide those four things. And here we have Yahweh, the God of, of creation, the God, as Alan has been teaching us, who for a little while chose a people, the, the Jewish people, to begin to engage with humanity and is now engaging with us through Christ. Uh, but across all of history, that's the heart of man. People are, and even today, people who would say there's no supernatural. They're still trying to cobble together in some form or fashion some way that they can feel protected, some way that they can receive provision for life, some way that they can experience a presence that's outside of who they are, and some way of being guided through this very tricky life. And here we are, the people of God. But uh, Jesus uh, uh, purchased for us uh, a more excellent a better covenant. And that's the point of Hebrews 8.6. Uh, but as it is, Christ has ordained, a ministry, uh, has ordained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better. The covenant he mediates is better. The covenant he mediates is better since he enacted it on better promises. Another wor word for that would be stronger promises. So that's, so what, so here's the question. What does I will be your God mean for those who have entered into this better covenant? Well, I want to say to you, the four things haven't changed. <laughs> the, the, walk, the, the what, how those are walked out uh, has deepened and broadened, uh, but we still need protection. And guess what? Protection's available. We still need provision, and guess what? Provision is available. We still need presence, and guess what? Presence is available. We still need guidance. I caught myself right before I dove off the edge. <laughs> guidance. <laughs> and guess what? Guidance is available. Uh, so, now we're actually going to go into uh, presence and guidance a little bit more deeply uh, in a couple of weeks, a few weeks, when we go into this idea of knowing God, right? Uh, but I want to circle those two things and, and just simply remind us this morning, for those who may not be here in a few weeks, of two absolutely essential things the Lord Jesus taught us, taught his disciples, they were recorded for us by John, and now they're our revelation, they're our property in relation to presence and guidance. Let's think about, th think about John 14, 16 through 17. Uh, I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion. I love that, I love that word, companion. 
I've wrestled, and, and I found the, uh, the CEB. It's like, that's the word I've been looking for. Paraclete, one called alongside. I mean, they had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. They had been companion to him, but more importantly, he had been their companion. When they got into trouble, their companion helped them out of trouble. When they said something stupid, their companion covered them, covered their stupidity, although he did rebuke it a time or two. You know, the, the, their companion made provision for everything that they needed in life. Their, the, the, the Holy Spirit through their companion Jesus was bringing truth and revelation. Uh, but he said, I will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive. Now, we know that. We've read that for years. Let's remind ourselves of what that means. Only a new creation human being can receive the companion uh, to walk with them uh, but watch what it says. The world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. But look at this. You know him. In other words, for three and a half years they had experienced the Holy Spirit in their walk with the Lord Jesus. Um, uh, because he lives with you. But look at this. And will be, uh, will be with you or will be in you, it should say. Uh, so we need to understand that, that now we have a companion. So presence is no longer somebody with us. It's somebody with us and somebody within us. But then we also find, uh, I love this terminology, the spirit of truth, because now we talk about guidance. Isn't this what everybody's looking for in life? However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Now, how many people out there, although their idea of what all truth might be skewed, would not give everything they own to own all truth? And here we are, people who have been brought into a covenant through the blood of Christ. And part of that covenant is that we will be guided, that's the promise, into all truth. And uh, I, I love the fact that I can look back over 40 years now. Some of you for 30, some of you for 50 or 60, some of you for 5. And watch how, almost as if he's got some kind of divine installment plan. <laughs> I love that. He has been systematically... Now, there's a place where uh, Jesus tells why this thing would happen on a more systematic basis. He says, you can't handle it now. And do you know there's some truth you still can't handle? Do you know there's some truth I still can't handle? I'm still not ready for it. But I love this companion and the promise that when I'm ready for it, when the time is right, he will lead me into all truth. I tell you, it's really important that we don't judge ourselves or one another with regard to the level of truth we happen to be walking in right now. Because there's not one person in this room that you would lower your, you, you would just think less of them because you don't think they operate in a level of truth when two weeks from now they could exceed you not only in that truth but three other truths to, right. to, to be. Because their companion is with them. This is such a wonderful thing. Uh, look at the end of it. Uh, everything that the Father has is mine, and that's what is promised to us in the covenant. So, but let's talk about protection today. I mean, here we are. You know, I've got my mask over there, and that's not so much to protect me as to protect others. Uh, but, but, you know, we're aware of protection in a way as we're walking this, these weeks and, and days and even months now out. Uh, we're aware of protection in a different way in the natural, right? And you know, if you would have asked uh, any of these uh, kings, Asa, David, uh, Hezekiah, others, their idea of protection was pretty much the same thing you and I are talking about today with Matt. It was physical. You understand? that Their real concern was with these aggressive kingdoms that surrounded Israel or Judah. That was their concern. And so when you read about protection, for the most part in the Old, Old Testament, it's talking about physical protection. But let's think about something uh, that Paul reveals to us. Uh, there's a transition happen. Now, uh, here, let me say this. Let me try to say something this way. 
This is not uncovering a new reality. What's happening is there was a reality that God chose to hold almost covered over. You can now look back and see some glimpses of it in the Old Covenant, but only in three or four places if you go look for it. But for the most part, God hid over the reality of all that's, going, uh, that's happening in the, in the surrounding air, so to speak. Uh, but, but, it, but with the New Covenant, God pulls the lid off. And we're people who have the privilege of understanding, uh, I'm not wrestling against that person who's persecuting me. I'm not wrestling against the guy who just stole from me. I'm not wrestling against the teacher who seems to have it in for me. You know, in, in the Old Covenant, we would have had to deal with it solely and completely based on human interaction. That person has something, and, and God, you got to protect me from that person. But the lid has been taken off. And now we understand, and it's a great privilege, by the way, to understand this if we're mature enough to walk in it. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul wrote this, the struggle for us is not against blood and flesh. Now, somebody needs to hear that today, because you are still thinking that you're struggling against people, and it ain't happening. The people may be a conduit through which the warfare is coming against you, but your struggle is not with people. Your struggle is with, uh, with something that is motivating people, living through people, expressing itself through people. He goes on to say, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evilness in the heavenly places or in the surrounding environment. See, Paul unveils that for us. Now, here's the good news. We are a people who not only can be aware. I mean, it'd be one thing to be aware of that and not have anything we can do about it. I mean, come on. Now, I, you, know, you know, I've told you uh, back during December, I can't remember. It was the most, it had to be demonic, as Jackie and others pointed out. But a little snake got loose in my house in December. which is the reason I hoed up my hallway. <laughs> you know, I had to go outside and get the hoe. And I told Kelly, do not let the snake out of your sight. <laughs> I'm going to go around and get the hoe and come back in and deal with the snake. Do not let that snake get out of your sight, whatever you, I mean, I was like desperate that that thing not get out of her sight. Now, the truth is it had been woken up and it was sluggish and it could barely move around, but nonetheless. Now, think about that with me. What would have, why was that so important to me? I don't like snakes. Now, the fact that we did, I did kill the snake and I killed it brutally. <laughs> I have the hoe marks in the hallway to show the brutality of my attack. Even with the snake dead, I still did not sleep in my bedroom for four nights. I slept upstairs, just hoping if there were any of them left that they couldn't climb the stairs. Do you understand? I mean, because, I mean, if, I, if that snake wouldn't have been dead, I don't know if I would have slept at all unless we just wouldn't got a motel room. <laughs> Now think about that with me. If you and I know there is a demonic realm that is out to kill us, to destroy us, and then we're left to only know that it's out there, <laughs> that's worse than snakes. And for me to say that, that it's, it's bad. But look what Jesus said. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of? Yeah. Let, me, let me rephrase that. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on 
all the power of the authorities, the world powers of this darkness, the spiritual forces of evilness in the heavenly places. I, he's looking ahead. He knows he's going to pay the price of the covenant. He knows what's coming. He's training a church to arise in a world that, that God is uncovering another reality that, that, that heretofore most people did not know was even there. Yes, yes. Now I'm going to tell you something. That is protection. To know and to have full authority to deal with the, that which you know, that is new covenant protection. Now, I want you to jot a couple of, if, you, if you'd like, or you can remember them, they're simple. I'm not going to read them for sake of time. But go back and read with that in mind, Ephesians 6, 10 through, I have through 13a there, but go all the way to the end. Um, and then, then take a look at 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10. Those are the two, I tell you what, if, if you will understand, I'm just going to go back here just for sake of saving time. If you will understand, if you will dive into, okay now, now think about this. The Lord has promised that the spirit of truth will lead us into all truth. Is this included? Yes. Okay. So if we will take Luke 2, 10, 18 through 19, and we will take Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, and we will take 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10, and we will go into those, we will lean into those three passages, I promise you, give the Lord enough time, revelation will come, truth will come to your mind, and faith will arise in your heart. You know, it's funny, I mean, I, I've, uh, y years ago when we first began to deal with the demonic realm, um, it was first exciting, <laughs> and then it was like, dear Jesus, this is exhausting. <laughs> But, but once I, you know, I don't know about you, but once I, once I understood, I mean by revelation in my heart, that I had authority, that settles something. Now the only thing is, I just need to know it's there. It, the whole thing shifted. Now I just need to know it's there. And there, there's no fear if I know it's there because what? There's revelation of authority that has been given through the new covenant. Amen. I hope you can see that. So the demonic realm is not anything for us to fear. It's real. And it is wreaking havoc, no doubt about it. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. But they are powerful in God to the pulling down of strongholds. And I tell you what's going to happen over the coming months is you will see the church arise. Amen. I tell you what the church needs now is desperation. We talked about that. I tell you what, my prayer is the church doesn't go out until they've gone down. Amen. Go down to your knees. Amen. Get strategy from heaven. Amen. Get the heart of love from, from God. And then stand before the throne room and do the business of heaven. And I tell you right now, uh, strongholds are going to fall. N national strongholds are going to fall over the, over the coming months. I'm telling you, that's going to happen. Why? It's because I believe all over the nation God is equipping His body in a fresh new way. And there are people who are going to rise up, not in some weird prideful way. Not in, in fact, the truth is, the, the ones that are going to do the most damage to the kingdom of darkness, you and I will never see them. Because the work's going to be done in a hidden place. Now, I want to ask you something. I can see we just need to land at this one here in a moment. So, now I want you to think about something. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven.
win. Now let's remind ourselves of the way of life that Jesus followed. This is the guy who often slipped away to be alone with the Father. This is a, a man who um, was him, became the throne of grace, but he, he cut the path to the throne of grace for us. It was there before. Listen, those disciples were delighted and surprised. They were giddy like little children. And they should have been. Nothing they did bought that. <laughs> but the chief intercessor, standing before the Father, moved in his office, and the earth shook. For the first time in centuries, the powers of darkness shook. For the first time in centuries, the powers of darkness shook. You need to hear that. For the first time in centuries, the powers of darkness gave way. Amen. And Jesus reported what he saw in the private place. I saw it happen. As I was with the Father, I saw it. As I was interceding, I saw it, and the, the authorities of the kingdom of darkness began to tumble and fall. Yes. Now, I want to ask you today, no upraised hands, only yielded hearts. Who is in this number? Who is watching online? Who is willing to say to the Lord, here am I. Send me to my knees. Here am I. Meet me in the private place. Here am I, God. Let me enter into that private place and do business that nobody will ever know about. No books will be written about me, but let me go into that private place and let me stand in the authority of the blood covenant and let me speak to that which you show me and let the kingdoms of darkness begin to tumble across the face of the earth. Let your kingdom come and let the kingdom of darkness fall in my time, oh God. I want to ask you today, who's willing to say yes to that call? Because the covenant, the blood covenant, has paid for the privilege. You can't earn it. You can't fast enough to get it. You may fast as a result of the Holy Spirit guiding you once you're moving in it, but you'll never earn it by fasting. You'll never earn it by cutting your flesh. You'll never earn it by attendance at church. You'll never earn it in any way. The blood covenant has already made the purchase. Ours is to say yes. Amen. Now, I want to do something that we did in the early morning time. This will look different for every person. What it looks like for you, do not project that on somebody else. But I do want to call forth something publicly that we've already called forth privately. I will tell you the things that God is desiring to do in fullness in the earth. And by the way, he will pull it off. <laughs> Can I say that to you? Uh, don't worry about God. If, if you're spending any time worrying about whether God can handle what's going on, just let me put you at peace. He can handle it. His intention is not going to be hindered. I, I, I chose that word. You might say it's not going to be stopped. I said he's not going to be hindered. His, the timetable of the kingdom of heaven is not going to be hindered. Because if the current body of Christ doesn't have the willingness to enter in, he'll just bring new people into the kingdom. And in the zeal of their new coming into the kingdom of God, he'll put them right there where they need to be. Because it's the blood covenant. So I want to release something publicly that I think is so critical. We got a t touch of it last week. It's touching here and there. But Father, in the name of Jesus, we recognize 
uh, that it's going to require a travailing in the Spirit to accomplish what you are going to accomplish. So, Lord, I want to speak over this body, over every willing heart, male and female. I speak over every one of us, God, uh, and we say, Lord, whether you choose to use us in this way is your business, but we are available to you knowing that this is an essential part of the kingdom moving forward. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we will yield our lives to you in holiness as best we can. Father, in the name of Jesus, we will yield our minds to you in humility as best as we can. Father, in the name of Jesus, we will yield our attitudes to you, uh, Lord, with great humility as best as we can. But we invite you to use us in this hour. And I invite you to use this body in this hour. Holy God. Isn't it a wonderful privilege? To have nothing to fear but God. And that not even the same kind of fear. I want to invite you to stand. Saints, listen to me. These are exhausting and trying times. These are confusing and challenging times. And you and I have the privilege of being the church on duty. Alan said it this morning. You can choose to go home and sit and watch TV, or you can choose to rise to, to the occasion. I'm calling us to rise to the occasion. In our hour. As the kingdom of darkness begins to fall, people are going to begin to come because they're going demonic bondage. And the problem is not with people. The problem is with the blindness that's over them. Paul wrote that in 2 Corinthians 4. But we are the answer to that in the earth. Your kingdom come. Let the blindness fall. God, we pull down the stronghold of darkness. Let the harvest come. You, 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 you and I, we have the privilege of being the church now. singing this song that we've been singing for four months. Listen to the words that we sing today. Only those who say yes to the Lord, only those who are aware of the blood covenant, 